All right, kiddos, good morning. You're actually sitting, and I'm going to change that. Can you guys come up here? Today we are going to look at this thing up here. Do you know what this is called? Matt. It's a nativity scene. Now, we see these all the time at Christmas time, right? It, none of you have, can probably say that you've not seen it. Can we get some of these younger kids up front, taller kids? Come on up, Tay, Corey. Come on up, guys. Okay. So, but the cool thing about a nativity scene is that every piece means something. We look at it and we see Jesus and Mary and Joseph and all the characters, but each of those characters has a special meaning. Now, a long time ago, there was a guy, and a lot of the adults probably know his name, but his name was St. Francis of Assisi, and he made the first nativity set ever. And the reason he did it was because a long time ago, back in the year 1223, so that's a long time ago, he thought people were thinking as Christmas, of Christmas as a time to get gifts. I don't think it seems like that was that long ago, when you think of his reasoning. That's right, Santa brings presents. But St. Francis said, well, I want to make people remember that Christmas is all about Jesus. And so he made the first nativity set. But there's some interesting things about them. Now, obviously, who's this guy in the middle who's, it, who's it's all about? Jesus. Jesus, right. And our Jesus, that is the mom. Do you know her name? Her name is Mary. But first, Jesus. Jesus has a halo. You see that yellow thing around his head? You, you did it. Awesome. Well, the halo means that Jesus is from God. It means he's holy. And if you look at our nativity up here, Jesus is the only one that has one. Okay? They didn't even give the angel one. So it means that Jesus is from God. <laughs> and then Jesus, though, our Jesus... His hands are kind of outstretched. They're off to the side. So it says that our Jesus, because his hands are out, means that he's offering us the gift of salvation. Hey, girl. Okay. Hey, girl. So, so our Jesus is saying, come to me. I'll, I'll bring you salvation, and I'll take care of you. Jesus is saying, I'll take away your sins. And then we have Mary. Who, this is Mary. What color is her dress, Corey? What color is she wearing? Blue. She's wearing blue. Do you know why she wears blue? Because what do we see when we look up outside that's blue? Uh, the sky. And so Mary wearing blue shows that she is the link between that she's the link between heaven and earth. She's like the sky. So her clothes have special meaning. Um, let's see. What are Mary's hands doing? Do you see her hands? What are they over? What did you say, Blaney? Her heart. They're over her heart. So that means that it goes back to a Bible verse, and it's from St. Luke saying, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them. Okay, so that has special meaning. Now, who are the? Who's this guy? Blaney. He's a shepherd, and what does he have around his shoulders? Daniela. He has a lamb. So the shepherd is to represent all of us, the common man. He wasn't a king. He didn't just have a baby. He wasn't a rabbi. He wasn't a rich man. He was just your everyday person, just like all of us. And he's here to show us that. God is for everybody, okay? You don't have to, we're all special to God, so you don't have to be anyone with a special name to, to love Jesus. And the sheep, the sheep shows that he's the lamb of God. Thank you, Diane. So he, the sheep shows that the shepherd's showing the lamb of God, okay? That's what we call Jesus, all right? A um, couple of things. Let's go to the animals. Who likes animals? Do you guys like animals? You do? Dogs are awesome. Our nativity doesn't have a dog, but some do. Oh, that's a bummer. But what's these, what are these big animals called? Aaron. They're camels. And who did the camels bring to the manger? Blaney. 
The three wise men, very good. And the reason that St. Francis used camels was because camels can travel a long way in the desert. They don't need to stop and take a drink. So they have a lot of strength. They're strong and they can stick with it and they don't have to stop a lot. But they also can do that for a really long time. So the reason a camel is in here is, you know, maybe the wise men did have camels, but it also shows that Jesus' word is strong and it can stand the test of time and that it will travel to all the different lands in the world. That's a pretty cool thing. Let's see. We have this guy here. What do we call him? He is a, a bull or an ox. Yeah, a bull or an ox. And that guy, he shows us, where did he go? <laughs> well, he show, he's also about strength and the strength of Jesus' word and the strength of God's love. Now, Blaney already told us who these guys are. These are the three kings or the magi. And what's most important about them, it's hard to tell on our set, but they all look a little different in the face. So that's to show that they came from three different nations all the people who would learn about Jesus, and all their gifts are something different too. Does anybody, this is a bonus question for you guys, does anybody know what gifts they brought to Jesus? Noah. Okay, gold is one. Blaney. It's a long word. Frankincense and Matt. And myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold does come from the rainbow sometimes. I want to find a rainbow like that some days. Um, but all those gifts have meaning. Gold shows that Jesus is a king, and the frankincense shows that he's part of God, and then the myrrh shows that Jesus is going to die. Okay? So those are important gifts. But all of these things, every bit of our nativity set, tells us more about our relationship with Jesus. And do any of you have a, rela have a nativity in your home? Does anybody have one? If you have one, raise your hand. So you're probably, a lot of you probably aren't allowed to touch it, right? Or is it one that's okay to touch? Some of them are okay to touch. So maybe what you can do, because really what Jesus wants from all of us is a friendship. He wants us to be his friend. He wants us to know him. He wants us to come to him in prayer and talk to him. And so he wants our friendship. So maybe one day this week, you and your parents and your brothers and sisters can kind of go by where your nativity set is, and you guys can pray to Jesus together. You can talk about the nativity and all the things you see, all the different colors and people and animals. And <laughs> Disneyland's a cool place to go, too. Um, so we can, but go to your nativity this week, because Disney's a little further away. And so if you go to your nativity set, you guys can pray, and you can, you can spend some time with Jesus to form that friendship. And I have something to give to you. I'll give it to you just after we pray. So maybe you guys can have some, some cozy time talking about Jesus with your family. I'm going to give you all a packet of hot chocolate so you can make it this week. And maybe sit down and just kind of snuggle in with your mom and dad and talk about what Jesus means to you and, and how we be his friend and, and how we carry his message all throughout the world, okay? So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for coming into this world. We thank you so much for all the things you have to share with us and, and the ways you love us. Help us to remember you at this time of year and that you are the greatest gift from God and that nothing compares to you. In your name we pray. Amen. What day is it? Ah, night. Really? Oh, we got here Tuesday evening. Must be Thursday morning now. Huh? Yep, by 30 minutes. Oh, the nurse's station is even closed. What am I gonna do? Same magazines from two hours ago. Can't read it once, let alone twice. Oh. When I wanted sleep, I couldn't sleep. And now that I can sleep, I can't sleep. Everything okay in here? Huh? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, am I in the wrong place? No, not at all, you're fine. I just heard the noise and came in to check on. Are you sure you're okay? Look, my wife has been in labor since 9 p.m., Tuesday night, and it's just after midnight on Thursday morning. Let's just say, uh, fine is a relative term. Oh, expecting dad syndrome. Yes, I understand now. Well, actually, the doctor called it, um, 
pro protracted labor, uh, whatever that means. Ah, well, protracted labor is when the delivery does not progress for whatever reason. And back labor is when the baby's face up, which is upside down because the baby's supposed to be face down for delivery. Well, you don't look like a doctor. How do you know all that? Wikipedia. You spend enough time working on the maternity floor and you pick up a few things. Right. I suppose. Uh. Hey, don't leave. Uh. Can't you just stay for a bit? They gave my wife an epidural and a few pain drugs. Now she's sleeping soundly. While in labor. Uh. And I'm just here, by myself, awake. Oh, look at it another way. The night before a big day at work, school, before a trip, you can't sleep in anticipation. It's dark and all you want is for the light to get so you can get on with the day. That is where you are. But when dawn comes, the day begins, you don't think about more you don't think any more about all that waiting. You just move on into the day. The baby will come in its own sweet time, life will get moving forward again. And a year from now you won't even care about the sleepless night. Yeah, but it doesn't make it any easier getting through it. But you know, no matter how dark and sleepless the night, the light never really goes out. There's always the light. Well, now you're talking about God. See? You will, you will make a good father. Well, got to get back to work. And don't worry so much. Go back to your wife's room, hold her hand, relax, sleep will come. Thanks. Are you some kind of angel? No, but my wife will laugh when I tell her you thought that. <sighs> I won't forget. Yeah, I like this job. If you did not already know, the skits that the kids have been performing are based on the birth of my daughter, Jessica, our oldest child. Not so much the individual conversations, the overall concept. Jessica was a 48-hour protracted back labor. I didn't want to say that while Andrew and Laura were here because that would be scary. The dialogue, the interactions are fiction. The rest is real. Jared was a much more subdued 24-hour labor. The doctor was convinced that if we chose to have a third, we could get under 12 hours. <laughs> Jamie said no. <laughs> oh, but like this one said, everyone's experience is different. Every new birth experience is different. Every new conversion experience is different. The other thing about this story, these skits, the real story took place in a day and an age before cell phones, before Facebook, before selfie sticks. So we had to inform family the old-fashioned way with the room phone. There were three grandparents, and on occasions during those 48 hours in between contractions, I would call my mom in Portland. She was staying there until there was a real baby to hold. Then she'd rush down and let, them know, or let her know what was going on. And then I would call Jamie's parents. They were right there in town. Now it needs to be said that by this time, everyone was excited and anxious for the birth to be complete. Most particularly the two parents in the room. But that was not always the case. When we first told Jamie's parents she was pregnant, Susan, Jamie's mom, cried. They were not happy, joyful tears. She was very upset. She would not speak to us for nearly a week. Looking back, I have some 
sense of understanding of her viewpoint. I don't agree to this day, but I can understand what she was feeling. But to know that is to know the rest of the story. But first, let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills, once cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. It's not obvious. In fact, you probably haven't noticed it at all. But on occasion, if you look at Jamie, you might vaguely notice that there's something just a little odd around the eyes. Or if you're seeing her walk away from you from behind, you might notice that there's just something a little uneven about her step. In the summertime, if you happen to catch her wearing a tank top, you'll notice the heavy scar on her shoulder. But then it's rare that she's wearing a tank top that isn't covered by something else. Let me take you back to the year 1983. A beautiful May evening. Jamie was attending an installation for the International Order of Rainbow for Girls, of which she was a member, a Masonic youth organization. It was a formal event, complete with long dresses and hoop skirts, Oh, and boys in tuxedos. Jamie and a friend decided to go home to get some new music for the dance that would take place afterwards. It's about a seven-mile drive up and over a hill, back down, around a little chicane curve next to a cemetery, and then a straight run to the house. But the pair never made it back to the dance. In fact, they never made it to the house. Jamie's friend was driving. No one knows exactly what happened. A foot caught in a skirt of the dress, a mistiming in the wrong moment. Regardless, the car missed the second part of the chicane curve and ran headlong into a tree. Jamie is one of those rare cases of a person surviving an accident because she wasn't wearing her seatbelt. Part of the engine block was forced into the passenger seat, and she was pinned underneath the dashboard. The driver of the car was thrown out of the car, but she too survived with almost no injuries whatsoever. When Jamie's parents arrived at the hospital that night, they were told it was unlikely she would survive. Then when she survived, they told her that she would likely never walk again. She spent two months in the hospital recovering from that accident. But hear this also about that accident. From the man who responded to the scene, the call of the 911, and to the doctor who eventually operated on Jamie that night, literally everyone that touched her knew the family, knew her personally. In a community of 40,000, that's kind of a remarkable feat. The Oregon State Trooper who responded to the accident was her campfire leader's husband from elementary school. The ambulance driver and the paramedic were hunting partners of Jamie's dad. The surgeon was the father of a fellow band member at high school. The surgical nurse was a friend of Jamie, Jamie's mom, Susan. The man who made the call to 911, who witnessed the accident, was the dad of Jamie's locker partner. Every single person knew her. 
I don't find that much of a coincidence. Here's the other thing you need to know. Jamie was not churched. Her family had been brought up Catholic, but fell away from the church as the kids grew up. Jamie's aunt becoming a Jehovah's Witness in the process. Jamie's mother's family had Baptist roots, but no one that she actually knew had ever been to a Baptist church, probably. Jamie occasionally might attend youth group with a friend, but not with any regular sense. But Jamie's best friend growing up, her family attended the United Methodist Church regularly, and so that congregation kept Jamie's name in prayer, and their associate pastor, the Reverend John Watt, made regular visits to Jamie during those two months. Oh, and of course, when Jamie began to walk, the doctor then promptly said she would never be able to bear children. Her body wouldn't be able to handle the stress. And thus, Susan's reaction to the otherwise happy news, pregnancy. Here's the thing. The thing that we're trying to get to out of this sermon series, and today in particular, every birth comes with pain and blood. Every birth comes with pain and blood. Don't kid yourself. It was not a silent night. There was pain and blood from a young woman, a virgin, giving birth in a stable. And birth is not always about birth. Birth comes about in many different forms. Returning from the brink of addiction. Regaining financial stability after crisis. Coming to grips with life after the grief of loss. Being baptized and claiming your faith for yourself in the sanctuary in the very midst of the people who never realized that they prayed for you through a very difficult car accident. The seeds of Jamie's faith were planted in the pain and blood of that scary accident. And she was baptized at Medford First United Methodist Church while she was pregnant with the second child she was never supposed to be able to have. She became the office manager of that church, and before, before she was hired, she finally started to let slip, but eventually led a United Methodist Women's Retreat where she finally revealed completely to everyone who she was and what they meant to her faith journey. Oh, and that first child we weren't supposed to have? First year she went to summer camp, the chaplain for that camp was Reverend John Watts. Don't tell me you can't see the fingerprints of God all over the world. If you feel that way, you just don't know where to look. I don't have to look hard. It's obvious. Everywhere. The fingerprints of God. But to get to that place, there's always a little pain and a little blood. So what do we need to do with all this? What does it say to me sitting in the sanctuary on this third Sunday of Advent? I don't know. Hits every person differently. Has to do with where you're at in your walk. Where the story finds you this day. 
Our faith is meant to be about transformation, change from broken human beings that we enter this world as. Transformation to the heart of God, exampled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that transformation takes place with pain and blood. And that can be as literal or as symbolic as it needs to be. Here's the thing you need to hear. It's the season of Advent. Correctly noted by Aaron, this is not the season of Christmas. It's the season of Advent. This season has nothing to do with gifts or lights or trees or nativities, or carols, or family, or friends, or food. Christmas doesn't even have anything to do with church. Christmas is about none of these. Those are the things that we have made Christmas about. They have their place. Some of them more than others. But this event of Christmas is about God choosing to give God's self to us. Entering our world in human form. Not to lower the divine, but rather the opportunity to lift the place of humanity up. The story began with pain and blood of a child's birth in a stable. The story leads us to the pain and blood of an execution beyond the city gates. The story has been passed down through the centuries in the pain and blood of martyrs and saints and family and friends and strangers that brought the story to your heart today. Countless people through the ages, examples of transforming life, that only Jesus can give. All that you might find a better meaning of Christmas so that you can eventually be sent forth an example that meaning for others to see. This year, this year, Let the day arrive when Christmas comes for everyone, everyone alive. That's what it means. Amen.